So let me quickly ask, how many of you are working in the context of AI? Can you raise the hands? Cool, awesome, good to know. And we all know AI is a big term now, right? You know, every, the world is moving towards AI. Everything becoming intelligent, making things easier to use. The predictions are helping to make, machines are becoming smarter, which are helping humans to become more smarter. And all industries, every company today is behind AI because they know that if they are not innovating in the space of AI, they're gonna get in irrelevant in coming days, right? And for us, what is for us as a design community and designers, right? So we all should know what's going on in the industry. And also we should also keep up about like, you know, upgrade our skills in terms of to become more relevant and we should get into something which is basically more meaningful and creating better experiences and stuff and creating great products, right? So I'm really thrilled and excited because I have a cracker of panel today, okay? So we have pretty nicely curated, have a different, we really choose hand-picked great people we brought in here and we have like four panelists today here on to the stage. And I'm gonna call four of, uh, four of them. So we have a person who actually created the whole uh, uh, AI-based community, especially AI ML community. And he's here, he's the CEO, CEO of a startup I will request Surya to come on the stage. Big round of applause. And we have a special guest here, you know, who is a co one of the founding team member of YouTube Kids, who is a person who actually like, you know, always think about AI, and his all his expertise is on AI. He worked on Google Home, and now he's big time innovating AI for transportation solutions at Google. I request Shiva to come on the stage. Big round of applause, guys. And we have one more special guest, you know? It's the person who actually create very smart, interesting mobile application, modern applications at Microsoft. The man behind that is Mr. Come on to the stage. And, and I have one more guest, actually, like, you know, we just requested him today. And he is so, he's so accepted request in this last minute, you know. And he's very special because, you know, he comes from a background of design agency, which is one of the world's top design agency called Design It. And he is doing interesting research on the space of AI in the context of designers and design. And I request today to come onto the stage. Perfect, sir. All right. What we're gonna do is, we will make it a little informal, and we'll make it, you know, little in a plain language. Let's don't get into all techie thing, coding, algorithm, and all of this thing, okay? Let's, what we're gonna try is, I'm gonna ask questions on behalf of all my friends here, okay? All of them are designers here. We have different breeds in terms of, you know, some people are really very experienced, there are some managers here, there are students and there are different kinds of perspectives. Okay, let's keep that in mind. And let's be careful, these wheels are rotating, okay? Then if something goes wrong, we need AI, all right? So, what we're gonna go is, we're gonna touch base on questions. So there will be a series of questions I'm gonna ask on behalf of them. So in terms of, to understand what is AI, what's going on in the industry, and then, what are the skills we require to get transformed 
And not just that, we also want to know, you're working at different, different industries and you know, world-class companies and stuff like that. We want to know what you're exactly doing it and what are your learnings, which my team want to learn from you guys. And then I want to have some questions very targeted to your profiles. And we'll end up this panel by your session one, session one thing, if you want to tell to my audience, what is that? Sounds good, guys? Perfect. Looks like you know everyone is ready now. So let's do one thing. Let's quickly introduce yourself. Focus on telling, you know, what do you do? Where do you work? And how do you explain AI in a simple language? Thank you, uh, Ranjit, for the kind introduction. My name is Surya Puchala. I am uh, founder and CEO for a uh, startup called Zetamine. Zetamine is, uh, Zeta is 10 to the power of 21. Mine is mining the data. So it's basically a big data connotation. Uh, it is Zetamine Labs, so we, are, we do a lot of education and then research into uh, developing the systems, uh, including big data analytics and AI. Uh, I am I am also involved in uh, building the community for AI and ML professionals uh, in Hyderabad. I was prior prior to this avatar, I was active uh, in terms of uh, building communities on data warehousing and uh, business intelligence, and then moved on as uh, things started uh, progressing. My take on AI: AI is. Uh, it is not some, it is magic in a way, because we are, we develop systems that adapt to the reality of the world without explicitly programming. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, so I am a product design manager at Google. Uh, I currently work in the geo product area, uh, GEO. Uh, and work on Google Maps uh, and looking at enterprise uh, applications. Um, and uh, previously I've worked on YouTube and as Ranjit said, worked on YouTube Kids uh, and also on the Google Assistant. Uh, and uh, within the Assistant, uh, I've worked on smart displays, um, ambient devices that, uh, that you can you know, put in your home. Um, and uh, have a lot of like uh, learnings uh, from those experiences uh, that I'm happy to share. Um, in, for me, like AI, I consider it as a, a tool and new technology that that is enabling companies and uh, you know people to solve problems in a way that wasn't possible before. Similar to the different waves of computing that we've seen, uh, from personal computing to mobile computing. I see AI as another wave of uh, computing, um, uh, which needs, you know, we need to be uh, harnessing that uh, vast potential that AI brings us uh, uh, in a very human-centered way, is, is my belief. Hi, everyone. Uh, like, like Ranjit said, I don't do any of the wonderful stuff that, you know, these guys do, but uh, we utilize all the wonderful things that actually they bring to the table and actually we make a living out of it. I've been a designer all my life, that's 22 years and counting. I've worked across the globe, I've solved simple problems, big problems, small problems. Currently, my, I, I lead a fantastic award-winning team. We're part of about 500 people, 550 people across the globe. Uh, my area of interest uh, in this space, uh, uh, I mean, I, I'd be li lying if I say that I've been doing this for long, but yeah. I'm lucky, I'm at an inflection point where we get to talk, consult with customers, very large customers who always talk about digital transformation, changing world problems, wicked problems. And, and I think uh, maybe th until three, four years back, uh, for a designer, if you ask what does AI mean, it's Adobe Illustrator, right? <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think my definition of AI is there's this huge debate about, you know, is it good, is it bad? All things, it's, it's all applied uh, intelligence or applied knowledge. You can use it for good or bad, it's like a knife. Uh, do you want to clip a flower or do you want to clip somebody of types, right? So I think you cannot actually give a def definition of what AI really is. It's good. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it, like in the early 1800s, 1900s, when they said when people moved from horse-drawn carriages to, we all know the Ford story, when the car came in, people said all the horse guys are going to die, all the horses are going to die. No. I, mean, I, I think at least there are 
there are 10% of people here who own more than one car. Right? The horses didn't die. <laughs> so <laughs> I, think, I think it is very powerful as a construct and I think as we go along, we will definitely share things. I, for one, definitely have two, three amazing uh, stories to share. I will share it and hope that you have some interesting takeaways and yeah. Hi, I'm Parag. Uh, so I work uh, at Microsoft. And my current uh, responsibilities at Microsoft is about uh, creating solutions uh, which and to solve the problem related to mobile productivity. So we build mobile apps and Microsoft Office mobile apps. Uh, in the past, I have experience of working in uh, various streams with multinational companies around healthcare, security, process solution, education, and even some solutions in agriculture space. For me, uh, AI is about uh, augmenting uh, to, you know, it's augmentation to human intelligence. It gives you capability to do more. Uh, like, you know, the, we talked about uh, the industrial revolution, which gives you maybe the physical power to do more. And this is about, it is adding to your intellectual power to do more. And that could be either the way you interact with devices or the way you make decisions, the way you understand anything. It just helps you to do it better. So that's like augmenting to human intelligence is AI for me. So, okay, let me jump into next question. How is UX actually shaping AI? Can you actually provide some real context or real examples from your business, which every day you're looking at? So yeah. Wow. <laughs> this is a toughie. Uh, <laughs> is it okay? Okay. Is it working? Okay. <sighs> The UX portion, actually, uh, AI yeah, uh, geeks like uh, for the geeks like me, uh, the, it is predominantly the algorithms which will generalize the behavior and then uh, you know extract patterns from the data, then present it to the user. That is what most of the AI and ML algorithms does, and. Uh, our teams, basically the teams who are working with me, they work working on the pure data to extract the patterns using statistical methods. We call it machine learning methods and AI methods. When we develop systems for our customers, uh, what we do is we take their data and then analyze, we take, for example, if it is statistical analysis, so by, you know, we do things like central tendency, et cetera, et cetera, and what is the spread and all that. These are very, very uh, rudimentary basic stuff that we do in order to represent the real world. In terms, when we, whenever, my experience is, whenever we do all this analysis, this is a lot of hard work. Uh, this is also called, it's also a part of data science, we call it. That means we are trying to do a lot of experiments and our tools are the data. We take the data and then we perform lot of hypothesis testing and to see the causation, the causal relationships or the interaction between various pieces that is happening within the data. And data is encompasses the processes that generates all this data, right? The processes are the piece where the objects, that is the users, interact with the system. So there is always a middle tier called a UI, we call it, user interface, right? So the user interface works with the backend uh, in two ways straight. So whenever we talk about uh, this analysis being done, the consumers of the analysis is either the data scientist, which is a geek, or a consumer. For example, the consumer can be uh, we as consumers of uh, Amazon's recommendation engine, right? Or we could be consumers of Uber, uh, which estimates uh, the ETA of a specific vehicle coming to you. Right? These are all the interfaces that, are, that have to be built in order to be consumed by the users. So whatever work we do at the back end is inherently or intrinsically, uh, if it has to be adopted or consumed by the users, UX is very important. Uh, in my perspective, like any AI-based solution will fail 
unless it solves uh, or provides unique value to end users. Um, so it, it needs to be human-centered from the get-go. And, and you, as UXers, we have the you know, uh, big role to play in uh, defining AI is expressed uh, in, in terms of the solution uh, to a given problem. Uh, and you know, when we think about like Google Assistant, uh, we don't necessarily think of it from a technology standpoint, but like what does it help people do accomplish uh, and how are the needs fulfilled by AI? Um, so I think like as UX you know, professionals, uh, we have a big role to shape and humanize uh, AI. So I think, I think 50% of my answer was like literally hijacked by these two people, so <laughs> I'll keep it brief. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm a context guy. I've always been talking, I mean, you will find me more often than not to the extent of borderline getting bored, context. Context is all that matters, right? Uh, yeah, there are a lot of things that as we are sitting and speaking, a lot of things are happening, some, you know, People, you're getting tracked or you're not getting tracked and all that. For me, whatever you do under the hood is under the hood. Not many people know how a car runs. Maybe back in the 50s and 60s, people knew. People, I know, I know at least one person who actually built an aircraft in his backyard, and I'm not kidding. I can give you the reference and you can see, but today nobody cares. But having said that, I think like what my learned colleagues have told, uh, you can do all of the things but if people don't consume. I'm not even going to use the word user here because it's kind of user. I mean, there's a big debate in our industry saying should we even, and it's an acquired behavior. Uh, English is a funny language. You cannot find another better word for user. Some, some of them said customer, some of them said consumer. But yeah, as people, human-centered, frankly, uh, I mean, at Design It, we fundamentally say what matters to people matters to business, and our tagline is simply design what matters to humans. So. If you look at the hub and spoke model, you run a business, business is all about P&L and revenue and loss and all of that, then comes people. Anything in life, right? But some agencies have stepped back and we are one of those pioneers who, I'm not marketing design it by the way, I'm just <laughs> setting context for <laughs> what we believe in. And we say put the human at the center of it, whether it's AI or ML, how can I make a difference in that person's life? Uh, from, so we call this, trans, you know, trans, I wouldn't say, trans, you're commuting from uh, on one end of the spectrum, it is basically convenience uh, to criticality. Any human life can be segmented between convenience to criticality. And, and today, I think AI has gone to such levels, convenience. I need an Uber, I need to book an Air and Airbnb, it is convenience. Criticality, I mean, a single drop of your blood can actually tell you how you're going to live, how you're going to die probably. Uh, it's scary, but it won't happen anytime soon. <laughs> or what are the things that you need to do basically to, you know, mitigate a lot of things. Even 10 years back, you didn't have the technology, right? So I think we guys are at the intersection of a lot of things, and then there's a, this big debate about, uh, uh, you know, AI dominating the world. No, I can assure you, we guys as designers are very safe, and we are in good hands And, and as we go about. But yeah, how people experience convenience to criticality day in and day out is what matters. Uh, be it AI, ML, or the next things, right? Because we haven't changed the last 5,000 years cognitively, and I don't think at least for the next 50, we won't change. I can take a $1 bet. 51 years later, what happens, I don't know, but change is very hard for humans. So context matters. So I think the question was how uh, AI is shaping the UX. So I think one, so I'll take two uh, dimension of this question. One, if you look at purely from an experience perspective, I think AI is helping us to make the whole experience more and more natural, as in it almost feels like as if you are interacting with human. So now you have the voice base assistant and you know you don't have to go through the layers of graphical user interface. You can actually ask and you get the answer. You just, hey, set the reminder, tell me the headlines, and then you just get it without actually navigating through the layers of uh, interface. So it is making the whole experience more natural as if the way you are interacting with human, whether you interact with voice or text or even including visuals. So that is one dimension where uh, interaction and the experience is becoming more and more friction free and natural. And it reduces the sort of, uh, you know, the barrier and the learning curve for anyone to start interacting with devices. So, you know, you are actually 
making it more accessible and more inclusive so that more and more people with their limited abilities and skill are able to interact with devices and take the benefit out of it. So that's from an experience perspective. The other dimension which it brings is uh, the possibilities to solve some of the problems, like very real tough fundamental problems which we were not able to solve very effectively with AI, uh, we can start to think about solving those. And these are tough problems in the space of healthcare or education or agriculture. You know, so now with AI getting democratized, you can actually, even uh, small players can actually start thinking about leveraging these services and create solutions to really solve some tough problems. I think there are two dimensions. One, the experience is getting better and natural. At the same time, it is opening up possibilities to solve some real tough problems. Okay, that's great. Okay, let's uh, keep rolling. So one thing which my team here, my friends here want to know is we have process of doing everything, right? You know, everything needs some process or the other way to do it right. Okay? This is emerging. This is actually growing day by day and stuff. And it needs a lot of agility. And also, basically, it needs some fundamentally, like, you know, trial and error kind of thing, right? I'm curious in terms of because you come from uh, different development technology and stuff. You know, you have Google has its own processes and stuff. Microsoft has its and design it as an agency looks at it in a different way because, you know, they have a different uh, phenomenon of it. We would like to know the process of designing for AI. Wow. Uh, any development of any system is a uh, is an initiative or a collaboration between various core competencies. Uh, whenever we design systems, it is uh, I talk in terms of only geeky terms, right? Uh, I talk about you know what is the front end and what is the back end, right? Uh, so, no one person would have the range of skills that are required for developing systems that interact with the users or the business. Given this context, uh, and then we are consumerizing a lot of services, for example, your geo services, right, the location services, tagging, the real-time moment. These are all the services which are uh, happening in the real time, and they have to be rendered on your devices, uh, uh, either it is m mobile device or whether it is your pad or whatever, multiple devices. And the way it is rendered is nothing but the process that happens at the backend. And the backends now consumes a lot of data and digital footprint that we ourselves have uh, developed. I mean, the users of that service have developed. So it is very important uh, for the UX developers to understand little bit of what AI is doing, and then for the AI, for the machine learning experts and data scientists, they will have to understand what is this service that they are developing and how it is how it has to be consumerized. So it is an interplay between the two. Awesome. Um, so at Google, at, you know, there are thousands of teams working on AI-specific features uh, or you know, adding uh, new features that are built on uh, leveraging AI. Uh, so recently, you know, uh, there is a team across like all the various product areas within Google that came together and created uh, a guidebook uh, called uh, People and AI uh, Guidebook. Uh, so definitely check it out. Uh, pair with Google.com is the uh, URL. But uh, the learnings, I mean, across all these developments, uh, boil down to uh, how you design systems and uh, products with any new technology, right? Uh, and uh, these are meant to be. Uh, not prescriptive, but like uh, you know, provide you guidelines uh, in a nascent uh, industry uh, to to leverage uh, from our mistakes and learnings, right? Uh, what worked, what didn't work, um, whether it is uh, you know fairness and bias uh, that might uh, creep into AI systems, uh, how you train the ML models and the uh, data that you feed into the models, right? Um, you know uh, the. 
fallback options and uh, graceful uh, you know uh, degradation of service uh, if if uh, the ai is not able to uh, provide a solution um, or if the recommendations uh, that ai is making like how can you make it interpretable easily uh, the reasoning behind like something that's being recommended and also like uh, there is a list of use cases that ai is, uh, ai is really good at solving but th there are some use cases that it's not really good at solving so we are uh, actively working on you know, documenting some of these uh, so that they could be of use uh, um, to, to anyone outside as well. So, so um, I think, I think his, uh, his Ranjit's question was, how do you design for AI? Uh, what's the UX aspects of AI? So you don't design, I, mean, I think UX, you don't apply to AI for. I think in my case, uh, my vantage point, it's with. It's not for. For is where the problem happens. Because, yes, the engine gets trained. The engine tells you a lot of things. And we all know about the famous target pregnancy story, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm sure most of you know. But was it a design problem? Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, if, if any one of us, you, me, or anybody wearing the interaction designer's hat, uh, actually, if we had to really think about it, we could have solved that. It's simply an edge case, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. If x is not equal to y, do something. And they flipped it, and it so happens that the girl got docked. Number two, <laughs> uh, you you design f with AI. AI just is, is, is a means to an end, as is UX or CX is a means to an end. At the end of the day, what are you trying to do? As a business, you want to solve an un unmet need or a need, and you're making money out of it, and there are consumers, and then there are customers, right? So uh, in, in Design It Again, like I said, we put the human at the center of everything, and then we say that, how can I make things better? Uh, everything is a process, like he said. Everything gets distilled. So UX is just one aspect of it. You need to step back and look at it from a very systemic uh, view of, am I solving the problem? Uh, today, in today's day and age, I think a lot of UX is hidden. It doesn't exist, right? You, you, you don't know the kind of procurement that Novotel did to get, get you that uh, vegetarian soup, right? But there's a huge supply chain that is powered. And I can guarantee you these are billion dollar infrastructure. None of us know it. So that is where it is going. So I was telling Ranjit during our catch-up in the morning, uh, and it applies to all of us. We are all moving to a world probably in the next two, three years. Maybe Google's AI can predict that. But you are reaching, we, we will reach a mass point where no UI or no UX will be the greatest UX. Think about it. See how you will design for that. And that's, that's one of the wicked problems that we need to solve. So yeah, so my summary would be you design with AI or ML or anything and not for it. Because technology grows, the exponential rate at which these guys get to work on new technologies and tools, design doesn't change that way. Because human needs, like I said, are still primitive, still primordial, still 5,000 years old. <laughs> so I hope it makes sense. So uh, what is the process uh, you know, to design uh, with AI? And I agree with Uday on that point that we don't design for AI, we design with AI. So the, again, the fundamental is the keep human at the center. And I come from you know the old school, 20 years ago, or maybe more. I did my you know masters in industrial design. So that time, people used to do industrial design, and then people started to migrate into software design. And the same set of industrial designer actually migrated to uh, designing the UI because the fundamentals were same, and they were doing pretty good because they were holding to the fundamentals and not really getting worried about. Whether hey, hey now there's a website kind of interface versus you know I used to design a interface for a, a washing machine or sort of a juicer mixer grinder because the fundamentals of keeping human in the center, keeping them informed and in control, is still the same. And same is with the AI. So now technology is emerging from ha completely hardware isolated product to a connected product and you know digital solution and we are bringing more intelligence. But the fundamental is still the same. You have to keep human at the center, and you should know what problem you are trying to solve and what is the overall end-to-end -end workflow which you are, you know, the your users are trying to accomplish. AI today, again, people should not get carried away with this. You know, the whole AI and start to introduce uh, AI at every stage and you know all over the place because. AI can also do a very specific job well. So it is not something which can do everything well. So like you know, the Shiva said, there are certain specific things which AI can do really, really well. Like for example, voice speech recognition, it can do well. So if you have a scenario or situation 
where a speech recognition is the best way to address in terms of uh, you know enabling interaction you use that to solve that problem or if you want to solve a specific decision making problem in the entire workflow you leverage that decision making cognitive services to solve that problem but it doesn't mean that hey now everything will have a chatbot everything will have a voice assistant <laughs> and then because very soon you will if you start to paint everything with ai you will always end up in a situation where assistant will keep saying i don't understand that i don't understand that because it may not have that level of intelligence to solve every problem so what is important in terms of a process is to be aware of the correct workflow to be aware of the services which you can leverage in terms of speech text language decision making search and so on so forth which you can actually leverage effectively to solve a specific problem in the entire workflow if you are aware of the capabilities which you can leverage if you are aware of your users and what they are trying to accomplish then you can have the correct effective solution so i think from a process perspective it is important for you to know what is available and what users are trying to do and what is the right marriage of these two awesome that's great so let me ask you one tricky question for all of you guys okay and you can debate it you can agree it you may not agree it let's see how it goes and okay <laughs> we'll do the other way around the question is ai needs data for accuracy and on the other side data is sensitive what is important let 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 us know your thoughts yeah, so, right. okay. so Surya want to go from this side, let's sure, start yeah. from Prag. Yeah, I think the AI uh, can become more and more effective, it has more data and the more the data, the, the better the accuracy. So what is important is to maintain the privacy and security of the data. So as far as you have system in place which ensures the privacy and security of the data, uh, you know, you are in a good situation to actually have it because if you deal with a very limited set of data, you are you know the algorithm and the solution will not be very accurate and effective to actually leverage in a larger scale problem so you have to have data security and privacy in place to build a solution which can actually solve the problem so in my mind yes to so solve the problem where you have access to large amount of data and where you can actually enforce the right policies for security and privacy and these are the areas where you should go and start innovating so so again i mean i'm, I'm going to talk for and against and you know so I, because i don't want to <laughs> debate with my <laughs> co speakers just kidding so so yeah i, I think I, i'll ask a question i mean it's not a trick question ranjit posed a trick question but i'm asking a trick uh, actual question to you how many of you are on facebook wow and uh, me, I'm not. I don't even have an account, so that's why I asked. So <laughs> uh, it has got not got, got anything to do with data and privacy. I just don't have. So, uh, do you know how many people uh, beyond your seven degrees of separation? I mean, you won't know beyond one or two levels. Do you know how many people access your account or check your photographs, your goldfish, your dog, your cat, and whatnot? Does does anybody go to bed getting you know? I don't know who's going to see it. Who's does anyone get into that situation? Can you put your hands? Okay, so you get scared about it. Okay, there's one person out of the hundred people here, so negligible. <laughs> uh, so the point is, there are regulatory agencies, there are activists, there are there, people are people are cut from different fabric. Data and privacy is just that. Those are English words to me, unless there is a context to that. In a large enterprise system, uh, like take Aadhaar, if you if you anonymize Aadhaar data, you and me are data, right? your name you're, you're just a record in the you know database again privacy if people are worried about privacy people should not be putting uh, forget the goldfish even their fish bowl because today's technology can actually figure out many many things that you're not even aware of but people are okay but it has its pros and cons the the fight is all about am i using this again using this word for good or for bad privacy again is very relative i think I think all of us here, the speakers, the panelists, on all, all of that, whether we like it or not, one of the conditions that they said is, give me a Twitter handle. I created a Twitter handle just for this. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. And people, so you have to define the level, the fine grainness of, if you're okay the, to the, you know, if you're okay if the whole world knows that you like pink versus green and you have no worries about it, please go for it. But then 
don't get don't fret out saying some guy is going to come behind there's an there's a guy who's anti green or anti blue and he's going to come and dominate telling people convert no that's not going to happen uh, so what i'm trying to get at is data is data you can't do anything with data data has to be treated data has to be converted into information and then that information branches into two things it's just assimilation information like you are xyz that doesn't change right and then there is actionable information because you are xyz some agency some company some business can act upon it right then information becomes knowledge most of them think they have arrived there but none of us are at least i don't think i have the knowledge and then the final trans transition from information theory is to go to wisdom basically we die and go up that's wisdom <laughs> so long story short don't fret about data and privacy and uh, you actually lost it all of us have lost it it's customers uh, have lost it to the extent i think most of Microsoft and most of Google actually know more about us than anybody else. A simple thing is Gmail. Your Gmail knows more about you than what you actually know about you. So don't fret. As long as you're not done anything unethical or non-regulatory, you should be happy. This is my take. <laughs> uh, I personally think, I mean, pers privacy and security of data is really important. Maybe like not from your own like as a consumer standpoint but uh when like bad actors uh try to you know make use of the data for you know doing bad things right um so from that point of view i think like we need to take it seriously uh approach or look for solutions uh you know that can prevent as little data usage as possible right um, and, and it's, you know, this technology is like really nascent and uh, one of the approaches that people are taking is uh, this aspect called uh, federated learning, right? Uh, you have really powerful smartphone devices that are capable to run like ML models on the device. Um, so with this approach, like uh, what, you know, people are trying to do is uh, run the ML models uh, on the device itself uh, and the results get pushed out uh, to the centralized server uh, and not the data. So from that point of view, like anonymized results uh, help train the, the uh, larger system, uh, but your data is still on the device. So there, there could be like solutions uh, or approaches uh, to, to this uh, where you can still protect the data sensitivity and privacy, um, yeah, but still achieve the results uh, that you want to. All right, Surya. I have a long story because uh, I Let's work in short, data. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I predominantly work with data. So those uh, who have the Facebook accounts or who is browsing on the net, uh, this is one thing that I can say about it. There is nothing like privacy anymore. We don't live in a world of privacy. Uh, for example, what if I were to be able to calculate your IQ based on the interactions you do on Facebook, would you like it? And if so, who would be the consumers of it? Correct? That is one. And we are all, Google is found on ads, right? The type of searches that you do, right? So I pretty much can understand your digital footprint and the behavior do, that you exhibit. And then, here is the great thing about AI and ML. We've, AI and ML algorithms will be able to predict and prescribe, recommend wonderful things for you because in the age of digital uh, digitization of all these services, we are, our lives have become infinitely easy. That is through the wisdom that, is, that all these algorithms has gleaned from a similar billions of users, 700, 1 1.2 billion users. It is the wisdom that is gleaned from this, right? And this can also be abused by a few bad actors, right? For example, uh, stalkers can be there or people who can take your identity. Identity theft, it is called. And you can also be surveillance, right? For example, uh, for a um, for police or any crime detection agency, without your knowledge, they can still spy on you. Would you like it? Uh, is it good for... So the country laws, laws of the country and the uh, uh, scope of the country's uh, uh, over 
the other people cannot be controlled in such setup of social media and what we are doing. So privacy is completely lost. At the same time, we have to protect, it is, the onus is on us to protect our own information to the extent that is possible. But for all the services that we get, I think it is a great thing. So, because you have a mic, so I want, I want to ask you one question, sure. especially like, you know, you are really, really passionate about, I know that. Sure. You know, so Surya is focusing more on speech analytics, you know, so he's so passionate on it. He's doing a lot of research on it. He built a lot of products and services. Why don't you tell, you know, quickly on that? Okay. Uh, so when I spoke about it, you talked about passion. Right. Uh, when we speak about something, you can pick up uh, uh, whether I am passionate, I am interested in that, talking about that aspect and things like that. Because you are watching me, uh, the tonal differences that I have, that is that's the signal that you are getting, as well as you are also watching me. Right? That is the visual signal. So those, one is auditory signal, another is the visual signal. So any AI system is actually modeling the real world around us and picking up this signal and integrating them to make certain decisions. So uh, in my experience, I have developed a speech recognition system, uh, not speech, speech analysis systems by using Google Speech API as well as Emotion API. So Google must have spent billions of R&D on using and developing that API, right? We, they charged me for it, right, <laughs> heftily. And uh, there is an emotional uh, API which is also developed. The solution, what the solution does is, when uh, the, all the, most of the businesses, B2C or B2B businesses, they have call centers. And uh, we have BPOs here, right? A lot of BPOs, Hyderabad's, Progress started from BPOs. So they have call centers. And the most of the call is information. A lot of information is uh, embedded within their archives. It is never culled out and then, uh, you know, it is never leveraged. So what we try to do is to analyze the speech, figure out what are the patterns, what are the pain points, what are the trends that are happening uh, when uh, the calls come through and then identify the major topics of interest. Alert the management so that they can be addressed. That's what the solutions do. So Shiva, uh, you actually develop a lot of uh, home and all of this things, smart devices stuff. Mm -hmm. And I also know that you, know, you focused a lot on defining those principles and you know, planning the way processes and stuff. Why don't you tell few principles which you use for making your product successful? Sure. Um, so for Google Assistant uh, overall, like we, we have three principles and then I'll talk about like the smart displays, which is a, a entirely new surface. Uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, smart displays? Not many, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I'll touch a bit on uh, that. Um, but for Google Assistant overall, uh, you know, we have three main principles. Uh, one is you know, speak like human, but don't pretend to be one, uh, because it has you know various uh, limitations that it brings up. Um, and the second one is uh, always be there uh, as a sidekick, but don't come in the way. Um, and then the third one is be smart, uh, but then also keep learning to get smarter uh, through through everyday interactions. Um, and when it comes to the smart displays, uh, you know, it's a brand new surface or, uh, or computing paradigm. Um, and uh, have uh, folks used smart speakers or seen them? Uh, can you raise your hands if, if you have used or seen smart speakers? Um, so the, the, the idea of like this uh, smart displays is to add this another modality to uh, assistant interactions where uh, there is also a visual medium in which the assistant conveys information to you. Um, and the idea is that uh, you know, these displays can be ambient displays within your household uh, and uh, help you proactively 
uh, surface the right information at the right time in the right context um, and, and overall be helpful, right? Uh, for this, like, you know, uh, some of the principles that uh, we've developed are around, you know, when a assistant or a smart display lives in your home, uh, home being a communal uh, setup, uh, the, the device needs to kind of understand the preferences and the needs of the different household members and adapt to that experience. Um, and the second one is it also shouldn't come in the way uh, and not be distractive. So it should blend into the environment uh, and not be visible unless it's asked for. Uh, and the third is, you know, it, it has a lot of abilities. It's always on, uh, can be proactive and, uh, you know, remind you of things. Um, so provide value to the to the household in general uh, around getting things done. Cool, awesome. Good day. Same question? Or? Yes, same question. So let me ask you this question. <laughs> it's Good. not the same question. Yeah. <laughs> so they pretty much covered it, so. I know that. That's the reason I have a separate question for you. Go for it. You know? I am sure, like, you know, all my friends here are curious about that, you know? I know you are in between writing a research paper on will designer jobs will taken by AI or not? Can you tell more about it? Okay, so yeah, I mean these guys are talking about funky stuff, but I like to touch upon things that basically <laughs> make us live in fear. Uh, it all started, I don't know the time chronology, there was this famous TED talk uh, where the guy said, very famous guy, I'm not getting to know his name. He, uh, I think his TED talk is more famous than his name because it was very controversial. He actually went with mathematical accuracy and said by 2030, about 2 billion jobs will be lost, which technically is about 60-70% of the current employed population. And we just have 11 years, guys, please update your CV. <laughs> uh, so that, that set in a lot of, you know, controversies, debates across Reddits, Gedits and all of that. And then, you know, and then a lot of designers started thinking about, hey, hang on. Am I part of the two billion people who are going to lose jobs? <laughs> Am I not? Well, you have a job and you might lose it. but so rather than s taking a world problem that Google and Microsoft can solve, I think some of us humble mortals can basically have a build a POV on how does it impact me as a person, right? Because design is all I've been doing and design is all I know and I have no intent of changing my career at this point in my life. So then that lens was, are designers going to get affected too? So the resounding answer was maybe yes, definitely there was no maybe no to begin with. And I'll give you some real world examples of how that is happening. So again, if you remember I said we have to work with AI or any of these emerging technolo technologies and not for. Mm -hmm. How many of you have heard about the grid? Not a trick question, please Google up grid. About a couple of years back, there was this cool Silicon Valley startup that came up and said, hey, you know, give me four or five pieces of context, I will build a website for you. Mm -hmm. All the website designers in, the, you know, in this room, you lost your jobs right away, right? That didn't happen. Uh, while that was happening, Adobe came up with this, its Sensei framework. Sensei. Unfortunately, not many people actually went and uh, got their hands dirty. Uh, how many of you work on Creative Cloud? Raise of hands, please. Awesome. Most of them. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So interesting. How many of you have used the Content Aware tool? Okay, yeah. four or five people. Uh, can five so percent. five percent? Yep. So 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 do you know at the heart of Content Aware tool is tremendous elbow grease? mental finesse of people like him who actually abstract models, train the system, change that into mathematical models, and from, from a designer perspective, what does content ever do? Mm -hmm. If you have a photograph, uh, you know, with your gold pet goldfish and probably a neighbor, uh, you know, content aware knows there is a human element in this picture that I cannot crop. Like it may sound very trivial, but it is tons of elbow grease. There's already AI in our jobs. Is, it, is content aware going to steal your job? No. Cool. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I think this is fantastic. Yeah. And let's move on to Parag. Parag, uh, we know that, you know, you guys have solved problem for midwives uh, with AI. Can you tell a little bit quickly? To yeah, my sure. Here? So, like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, there are two aspects of AI. One is the experience you create and the other is the problem you solve. And AI gives you possibility to solve some real tough problem. And uh, Microsoft as well, uh, in uh, India as well, you know, there is a part of a, a Digital India initiative where Microsoft is trying to solve a fundamental problem. Uh, one of them is around, I'll take very quickly two examples. One uh, is around agriculture where 
uh, for farmers uh, in India, uh, the yield is a big problem. I mean, we are like 250 million farmers with uh, only 46% uh, percent, uh, you know, the land which is uh, uh, properly irrigated. And we have the second largest uh, tractable land, but still the yield is very low. So here was the opportunity for, uh, to actually leverage AI to inform farmers at the right time as to when to sow the seeds. And based on what is the condition of the soil, what is the, what is the condition of weather, and uh, what kind of a crop you are planning to sow, so the simple uh, solution which collects a lot of uh, parameter around the soil, weather condition, and the pest condition, and the crop condition, and gives you a very simple, uh, and the design and the experience here is, what is the experience you're talking about? The farmer just get an um, SMS on his feature phone. So they actually don't even need a, a smartphone to experience this very sort of a valuable insight. And you just get an SMS that you need to sow seed after three weeks. And if you do that, then you will get the, you know, the better yield of your crops versus the other farmer who didn't have this insight went with the conventional wisdom of sowing the seed three weeks ago. When the crops came, they had the farmer who followed the advice had the 30% more yield in the same sort of a land condition, in the same weather condition. This guy's got 30% more yield. That's a very simple intervention of AI which can lead to a very high impact. And the experience here is really understanding that who are the user and what is the best format in which the information can be delivered to them so that they can consume and take action. So we didn't build any great like a uh, you know chat bot and things like that. It's a simple SMS which comes to you at the right time. You just see it and take the action. This was one of the example of how you know AI actually creating impact. There are other example around healthcare where. Uh, the blindness is a big problem in India and there are 55 million blind people and then there are 70% blindness can be avoided if detected at the right time. And so what AI model where Microsoft is partner, partnering with the local hospital like LV Prasad here and globally with other uh, partners to uh, you know, predict the, the outcome of the surgeries and predict in advance that if the corrective action is taken, the likelihood of success is high so that you can take the intervention at the right time. So again, how do you communicate that information to the doctor? How do you communicate that information is to the patient is the user experience part of it, but the possibility of actually solving this problem uh, is huge. So here are some couple of examples, uh, you know, from the current uh, experience which uh, we have gone through. There are more, but you know, if time permit, we'll that's talk great. about that. I think that's great. I think, you know, so you guys are doing a tremendous job here. So, okay, one thing which I, I also want to give a couple of questions for my uh, audience here. Before that, you know, one question which I want uh, you guys to quickly tell one thing what uh, the suggestion for my team here in terms of, you know, so we heard that all of the product designers that they're evolving, they're ready to learn and stuff like that. So let's look at the two, three years context and guide us, you know, what are the skills required? How do they can up upgrade themselves so that, you know, they have a meaningful careers and they are to the industry mark. Any thoughts? I would say come and join our uh, executive education programs. It's a simple solution. So, uh, anyway, uh, the field, uh, any of the systems that we are developing currently, they are multidisciplinary in their nature. So, uh, I know a uh, lot of you may not be uh, grounded very, very solidly in AIML, but to, to realize what type of use cases that are available out there in the world and uh, the current uh, uh, systems that are built in AI, particularly uh, any of the consumer big, big uh, behemoths like uh, Amazon's or Google, Google services, Microsoft services, uh, just to be aware of what's going on in the world will keep you uh, on your toes and then that provides the uh, context for their learning. My advice would be you know, uh, to understand the capabilities and limitations of AI and see how it can help you with your work uh, in solving in user problems. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's amazing technology with huge potential, uh, but use it wisely and uh, humanize that technology. So I think I, I think most of us have just one minute to answer this question. So I'll keep it very brief. I think I was touching upon in the previous answer as well, right? AI is doing fantastic stuff for us as a community, as designers. Don't fear not, fret not. Your job is secure. 
But having said that, figure out how you can embrace like automation, right? Crop, cropping images, building some things. There are a lot of things that pieces of code and can actually do much faster than this. In our line of business, 80-20, 80% of the time is analysis, synthesis, uh, trying to figure out the right solution sets and then solutionizing. So look at this as a blessing. It will free up a lot of your time uh, in production time. Focus on things that you do best and let, let, let the automation actually do what basically it empowers you. So yeah, we won't lose jobs. So you are saying, you know, 80% is more analyzing research, thinking, whatnot, and 20% is design. Can I analyze that way? Yeah, because in any, I mean, I'll just take another minute. In, so the, one of the biggest problems with we designers is no matter how trained we are, no matter what we are, all of us have this, I think it's evolutionary that we jump at the solution. Yeah, you don't even know if you're solving the right problem. So I think technologies like these will make you think and you can be rest assured that I can still spend another eight hours trying to figure out this agricultural problem rather than getting into a debate of should it be three screens or four screens. So that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. So very quickly, two points. One is stick to fundamentals, keep human in the center. I can tell you from my experience when, you know, when we used to design enterprise applications in the websites, then there was this boom of mobile. So everything has to be mobile. And then people were like going crazy, hey, make a mobile app, make a mobile. I mean, you know, there are not everything has to be on the mobile. Similarly, not everything can be solved by AI. So just keep human at the center be aware of the capabilities AI can offer and then figure out what is the best solution. So that's my uh, advice. Awesome, that's great.